Welcome everybody to the AATRN seminar. Today our speaker will be Alex Wagner from Duke University and he'll be speaking on non-embeddability of persistence diagrams into Hilbert spaces. Okay, thank you uh, for the introduction, Henry. Uh, so everything I'm gonna talk about today is uh, joint work with Peter Bubenek. Um, so let's get started. Uh, so first, uh, what and why? So I want to explain uh, the motivations for the question we're gonna talk about. And uh, hopefully after the section, you'll be able to understand exactly what I mean by the title. Uh, so in this talk, I'm gonna be um, interested in a family of metric spaces uh, parametrized by P, which is between one and infinity, maybe up to infinity. Uh, the elements of these metric spaces are persistence diagrams uh, near and dear to many of us. For me, a persistence diagram is a function from some countable uh, index set into the upper half plane, so points in R2 where x is less than y. And uh, so for every p, I form a metric space. And the way you do this is basically like LP spaces. So the idea is you look at uh, a persistence diagram. And then for a given p, it's in diagram sub p if the distance from each point in the diagram to the diagonal, that sequence of distances, has a finite p norm. OK, so that's how I'll define it. Uh, this is a kind of abstract metric space uh, on its face, but it's motivated by a very um, specific example, uh, which is persistent homology. So um, if you have a filter topological space, um, you can kind of track the appearance and disappearance of um, homological features through this filtration. This gives you one of these persistence diagrams. Uh, in practice, we typically work with finite persistence diagrams. Um, and so yeah, so that's why we're interested in in the elements of this metric space. Um, but then we also need to motivate why we care about the, uh, the metric, these W sub Ps. And uh, the long and short of it is that the reason we care about these particular metrics is because uh, when you cause a, a delta change in the P norm of the input, in many situations, this roughly causes a proportional change in the WP metric. So um, it's kind of least complicated when P equals infinity, then you have, uh, uh, exactly proportional limitation on the change, but uh, in many other situations for other P, you also have um, similar kind of stability results. So uh, we like the elements of this metric space because they come from this example we really like, and we like the metric because uh, it's stable to perturbations. Uh, so next we need to talk about, uh, so the title is about embedding this metric space into Hilbert spaces. Uh, why would you want to do that? Um, so I wanted to briefly motivate this. So. Uh, you know, if you have an abstract metric space, it's not uh, clear or maybe even possible how to do things like take an average, uh, notions of direction aren't clear. Um, so one common way of getting around this is you um, use something called a feature map, and a feature map is nothing more than a function from your, uh, your set or your metric space into a Hilbert space. And then once you're in the Hilbert space, uh, you can do things like take an average by taking an average of uh, the embedding, say. Okay. And there's lots of other things you can do uh, if your, uh, say, you have two classes of data in S and you embed them into the Hilbert space. Uh, then um, you can do things like ask what's the best linear projection. Uh, that does the best job at discriminating these two uh, classes of data. And so when you change what best means, then you can recover things like logistic regression or support vector machines. So we like uh, feature maps because they really broaden the, uh, the number of things that we can do uh, uh, with our objects of interest. Okay, so just to briefly recap, so and we can try to understand uh, what we're doing here today. Uh, we're interested in this metric space of persistence diagrams with Bashestein metrics because we have uh, stability in many popular situations. If we map the, uh, the persistence diagrams into a Hilbert space, then we have a lot more uh, tools at our disposal. But precisely because we like the WP metrics that we started with, we want feature maps that don't um, distort these metrics too much. So uh, what are the kind of the two things that could happen that are bad. One is that you blow things up too much. So if your feature map makes the distances way larger, then um, you lose this nice stability that we had previously. So small changes in your input might get magnified in the Hilbert space to very huge changes, which could make learning difficult. Uh, the other problem, possible problem, 
is that you make everything too small and then it's hard for a different reason. So as an extreme example, if you just send everything to zero in the Hilbert space, this is super stable. Uh, no change in the input causes any change in the output, but uh, all of a sudden all the tools in the Hilbert space become useless. So we kind of want to balance these two considerations. Um, so uh, I want to talk about some related work. So if you, if you have this problem in your hands, the first thing you might ask is, okay, well maybe I can just map it into a Hilbert space and exactly preserve the metric. That would be kind of the best thing. Um, so that leads you to an isometric embedding. So, uh, so if you had an isometric embedding in the Hilbert space, it's precisely mean that the metric um, stays the same. Uh, and there are a few ways of seeing that this is not possible, but one which is um, kind of instructive is uh, the following example, which to my knowledge first appeared in this paper. So if you have these two um, persistence diagrams, say red X's and blue circles, uh, there are two separate um, geodesics between uh, these persistence diagrams. One is kind of the north-south one that moves from red X's to blue O's. And another one is the uh, east-west one, okay? And it, you can't, um, you, you could never have this in a space which is isometric to a, uh, isometrically embedded into a Hilbert space because a uh, Hilbert space is heavy new geodesics. So this is one way of seeing why you can't get an isometric embedding. Uh, so this is kind of the gold standard. So let's talk about what the silver standard would be. The silver standard and, would be- And Alex, can I interrupt you really quick? Sure. When you're leaning back, your microphone, I think, is rubbing on your shirt a little bit. Oh, sorry. When you lean forward, it's actually a little bit better. But yeah, if there's okay, a way I'll... to keep your mic, uh -huh. mic up your shirt. Perfect. Yeah, thanks. Um, so uh, this kind of silver standard would be that you have a bi-Lipschitz embedding. So a bi-Lipschitz embedding would just mean that you cause linear distortion uh, in the metric. Um, but there's this nice theorem by uh, Matthew Carrera and Willie Bauer that uh, you, you really can't get a bi-Lipschitz embedding. Uh, at least not globally on the entire space. Uh, so, okay, so now at this point, the gold standard fails, the silver standard fails, you can kind of go in the other direction and say, well, what's, can we get anything? Can we get any kind of metric preservation? And uh, that might lead you to uh, this definition. So, um, this definition was introduced by Gromov in 93. And so uh, a course embedding is a map between two metric spaces. And basically all you require is that you have these two functions, rho minus and rho plus, that uh, control the distortion somewhat. Okay, and they're very lax. They could be, um, they certainly don't need to be linear. It could be exponential and logarithmic. They could um, be uh, discontinuous. Uh, rho minus, for instance, could be zero as long as you want. All that you require is that uh, of these two functions is that rho minus eventually go to infinity. Uh, so this is on a, initially you might think a very innocuous thing to ask for, um, but uh, one point is that these rho minus and rho plus uh, you need to use the same functions over the whole metric space x. Uh, so for every x and y, and that's really going to be what um, what makes it possible to uh, not have one of these. Um, so I wanted to uh, briefly talk about the history um, behind some of the ideas we're gonna talk about today, because it's a very nice story. So in the 1930s, uh, Schoenberg gave a characterization of uh, semi-metric spaces that admit an isometric embedding into a Hilbert space. So a semi-metric space, you just require that the distance from a point to itself be zero and that it be symmetric. You don't require like the triangle inequality. Uh, and he gave a very kind of concrete uh, characterization of the semi-metrics that admit an isometric embedding. Uh, in 1970, uh, Perenflow answered this open question of Smirnov, which was about whether every separable metric space admits a uniform embedding uh, into L2 of the interval. And he, um, he kind of came up with a, an example where that uh, fails. In 93, uh, Gromov introduced the definition of course embedding that I just shared with you on the last slide. And he asked a very similar question to Smirnov, which is that he asked, can every separable metric space be coarsely embedded into a Hilbert space? In uh, 2002, nine years later, this group of people uh, 
answer the question negatively. They gave an example um, of a separable metric space that does not coarsely embed into a Hilbert space. And that example was essentially um, Enflow's example. Um, so they modified. So a very similar example is able to negatively answer both of these questions. And I bring up this history because we're going to use uh, that example today to prove a similar result. Um, so uh, let me just say what that example is kind of very roughly. So, um, well, let me do it differently. So you look at uh, ZNs, so just look at the integers mod n with the standard metric, quotient metric, and then take their product and put the soup norm on it. Uh, and then you just look at all of them. Okay, so you take the disjoint union of all of them for every n and m, and uh, this is roughly the space that doesn't coarsely embed into a Hilbert space. You just need to arrange, so it's not uh, exactly well defined yet as a metric space, because I haven't told you the distance between different ZNMs when n and m are different. And what um, the group at the bottom proved is that if the spaces are sufficiently far apart, the different ZNMs are sufficiently far apart, or sufficient is based on the n and the m, then it doesn't coarsely embed. OK, so our first uh, result we're going to talk about is that when you when p equals infinity, so when you have the uh, bottleneck distance, that this does not coarsely embed uh, into a Hilbert space. Uh, so first, a theorem. So suppose you have a separable bounded metric space, x. Uh, then you can isometrically embed it in a diagram space. And so the idea is very, very akin to um, what's sometimes called a Frechet map, sometimes called a Kuratowski embedding. And uh, the other caveat is that if you pick something larger than the diameter of the space, you can arrange for it to sit in this, uh, this annual set of the bottom here. Um, so I just want to talk about um, what this uh, map looks like. So basically, you just take a uh, countable dense subset of your metric space. And to each of those points, you associate um, an interval. So uh, arbitrarily. So here, let's say that this is the blue interval for these three points. Uh, this is the green interval, and the bottom one will be the red interval. And then what you do is you map each point in your metric space to just the height on that interval, which is its distance to the reference. So um, for blue, for instance, it's distance zero from itself. So we put it down there. Uh, it's distance, let's see, 0.7 from the green triangle. So it'll go maybe about here. And it's 0.9 from the red square, so it goes very close to the top, say. Okay, and then so in this example, each point gets mapped to a met, uh, persistence diagram with three points. And this gives you uh, an isometric embedding. Okay, so now equipped with this, we can, uh, we can prove this theorem. So basically the idea uh, is very simple, is you look at diagram space. Okay. Here's the empty diagram. And you build these little circles, or annuli, I guess. Uh, and you embed ZNM in this sequence into each of these. So here's Z, say, 1, 1. And this one would be Z, say, 1, 2. OK, and all you do is you arrange that they're sufficiently far apart so that you've embedded this, um, this N-flow Trinishnikov space uh, into persistence diagrams. Now you've embedded this space isometrically, and it doesn't coarsely embed, so the larger ambient space can't coarsely embed. Okay. Uh, so now we're going to talk about the case when P is strictly larger than 2. The strictly is important and uh, less than infinity. Uh, this uh, is a slightly different um, situation, but a similar kind of technique works. So uh, what you first might try to do is do a very similar embedding to the one that we just talked about. So um, what might you do? You might look at uh, an element of LP, have some sequence of intervals like in this last example. So if I flip back. Um, so here, you know, if, you're, um, if your countable dense subset is infinite, then these diagrams uh, will also be infinite. So you might try to do a similar thing for LP, but then the problem would be that it'll no longer have a finite P norm to the diagonal. So it will no longer be an element of the metric space. So you can't really embed, uh, really what it comes down to is the fact that, uh, you know, an element of LP might 
uh, go on forever non-zero. So you can't um, really embed a finite subset of LP into the diagram space using this kind of map, but you can do something uh, a little bit less, which is that you can just take a finite subset of Euclidean space for any dimension and isometrically embed it into diagrams with the p and distance. So um, how does this go? It's kind of a similar construction. So basically, you just um, have an in, uh, interval, sorry, a little interval for each of the uh, coordinates. You essentially project onto that coordinate, and then that's uh, where it goes on the interval. So if you send each of these guys down here, then that's roughly what you get here. Okay. You do this for each dimension, and this gives you an isometric embedding of any finite subset. You just need to arrange for the intervals to be far enough apart. So the last, oh, sorry, the second ingredient that we'll need in the P greater than two case is uh, this very nice theorem of no act in 2005. And what it says is um, something very interesting to me, which is if you want to know whether a whole metric space can coarsely embed into a Hilbert space, uh, really the obstruction is just that any finite subset can embed with the same distortion functions. So um, kind of the takeaway from this theorem maybe is that if you can do it for every finite subset, if you can embed every finite subset of X coarsely into uh, a Hilbert space with the same distortion functions, then you don't need to worry about your kind of local embeddings being compatible, so to speak. If you can do it for every finite subset, then you can find one for the whole Hilbert space. The distortion functions will change as you move to the, um, the, whole, the whole space, but um, you can just check that this is true. So you only need to handle it for finite subsets. So the final uh, ingredient in this case is um, this theorem. So uh, I wrote it in full because it's a very simple, or maybe not simple, but concrete condition that you can check for a bonic space that uh, if true, shows that it does not coarsely embed into a Hilbert space. So it's interesting because it's a very concrete condition you can check and then if it's true, it doesn't coarsely embed. So, um, so Suppose you have a bonic space X, so a normalized symmetric basis is a basis for your bonic space where if you uh, take an element written that basis, you permute the basis and you flip the signs plus or minus one, you don't change the norm of the element. So uh, a super natural example of such a basis is the standard one in the LP spaces. If you take an element written that basis, you permute the basis elements um, and uh, maybe flip their signs, you're not gonna change the norm. Uh, if you have one of those, and then it satisfies uh, this equation here, then you know that uh, your space doesn't coarsely embed into Hilbert space. And in particular, this draws a line in the sand where when P is strictly greater than two, you can use this condition uh, to see that it won't coarsely embed into Hilbert space. So now we have all the ingredients. So I just wanna give you a sketch of the idea. Um, so we're gonna prove this uh, non-existence of a coarse embedding when P is strictly larger than two. So suppose you did have a coarse embedding for a diagram space with P greater than two boxes and distance, then you would have some distortion functions. You could take your lower distortion function and just push it down by some positive amount. Uh, that positive amount of wiggle room that you introduce when you modify rho minus to this rho minus tilde gives you some positive amount by which you can approximate any finite subset of LP into some sufficiently high dimensional Euclidean space. Uh, once you've uh, once you've approximated it sufficiently well, you can then apply the isometric embedding from the uh, lemma and then finally hit it with the coarse embedding that you assume you have. What this will give you is that for any finite subset of, um, of LP, you've now coarsely embedded it into the Hilbert space using um, rho minus and rho plus, rho minus tilde, excuse me, and rho plus. And so then that would contradict um, the, the fact that LP doesn't coarsely embed. Uh, oh, so one fun uh, corollary I want to talk about. So uh, it's well known in a lot of different ways that the Gaussian kernel on bosch sign distances will not be uh, a valid kernel, so to speak, for every bandwidth. In other words, it won't be positive definite for every bandwidth. Uh, but using these techniques, you can then easily see that if it doesn't admit a course embedding, it also uh, won't be a valid kernel if you hit it with any alpha that's uh, non-decreasing. So there's nothing kind of special about the square. Any alpha is going to fail for some bandwidth. Just a fun application. Okay, and then now uh, I just wanna end by talking about some future work. So there's two uh, open problems on my mind 
important uh, with respect to this question. Uh, here's the first one and here's the second one. Very natural if you uh, work in this kind of area. So uh, yeah, so having done all this, it's extremely natural to ask what about P equals one and two? If you step back for a second, uh, what was our motivation? Well, people use feature maps to do machine learning on uh, persistence diagrams sometimes. Typically in practice, which is to say for applications, you care most about P equals one and two. Um, those are uh, kind of uh, fine enough that they do a better job. And so you'd really like feature maps that preserve these. The problem is that uh, our techniques for showing that when P is larger than two, you don't have a course embedding really depended on the fact that the corresponding LP space didn't. And obviously that's not a strategy that's gonna work for you when P equals two. So you're already starting with a Hilbert space. Uh, a little bit of related work. Um, so in 2000, uh, Gu Yang Yu proved the course bomb con conjecture for spaces that admit uh, course embedding into a Hilbert space. And he also provided a very concrete uh, condition you can check. And if it's satisfied, then you have a course embedding. And then in 2019, a group at UNC Greensboro proved that um, persistence diagrams for any finite P uh, have a discrete subspace that fails to have property A. Now, that particular subspace that they embed is actually known to coarsely embed. Uh, so Funny enough, uh, it, it, um, we still don't know whether or not uh, persistence diagrams with the P equals one or two uh, Wasserstein metrics uh, coarsely embed in Hilbert space. Okay, so just a brief uh, recap of what we talked about today. So we like feature maps because they allow us to apply more algorithms. Uh, we like Wasserstein distances because they uh, have stability and putting those together, we now want feature maps that don't cause too much distortion. Uh, there's uh, previous work that uh, isometric and bilipsitz embeddings are impossible for the entire diagram space. Uh, what we talked about today is that when P is strictly larger than two, you can't coarsely embed uh, diagrams with the P Wasserstein metrics. Two uh, future work questions that I'm interested in are, well, what about when P equals one and two? When P equals one and two, do you have a course embedding of this whole space? And then I think a very practical, reasonable question is are there subspaces of the space of diagrams that admit good embeddings? You know, in practice, you're never going to touch the entire metric space of, um, of persistence diagrams for any P. And so it's very reasonable to ask whether you can get good embeddings uh, if you restrict somehow. So an example of when this is already known is if you look at the slice Wasserstein kernel, if you bound the number of points in your diagram, then you can actually get an upper and a lower bound. So things like that are very interesting. Are there practical scenarios where you can get a good embedding? Um, so that's everything I want to talk about today. And if uh, you're interested in this and you want to talk to me more, you're more than welcome to email me at the email listed here. Thank you very much, Alex, for the nice talk. Uh, before we get to questions, go ahead and unmute, unmute yourselves briefly and let's applaud for Alex. All right, questions? I have a quick question, if that's okay. Um, so it's a little, uh, it's a little open-ended, but uh, so kind of some of the results here seem to say that the space of persistence diagrams is metrically maybe a little, a, a little unwieldy and bad to work with. Suppose you were interested in, in um, let's say, interleaving distances between multi-parameter persistence, like supp supposing that was computable. Is there a sense in which that is like worse? In other words, is there something nice here about at least one-dimensional persistence that it's there's something yeah, good about so, it that it could get worse. Right, yeah, so I've been told this is a pretty pessimistic talk. Uh, all the results are pretty negative. Uh, and let me be negative um, more, which is that I think that it's about as bad as it can get in the current situation. So with respect to wanting a course embedding, I mean, it can't get any worse. You already don't have one. Um, in terms of, are, like, are there specific scenarios where you can get nice embeddings in the one-dimensional case that kind of break down in the multi-dimensional case? Uh, I don't know, but that wouldn't be surprising. But just because once you move from one to two dimensional persistence, it's so much more unwieldy. Thanks for the answer. Other questions? I was. I oh sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Just a comment on. Um, uh, by the way, great talk, uh, Alex. It's a really good talk. Uh, I have a comment on your last question that is uh, showed on the slide, embeddable subspaces. Mm -hmm. So I think it is proved that, uh, that the space of persistent diagrams on, on boundedly many, on endpoints, uh, 
on any distance coarsely embeds in Hilbert space. So this is a result of work and uh, myself. Uh, yeah, so that's- Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, that's okay. right. Uh, um, when you bound the number of points, uh, you can get good embeddings. And in particular, uh, as I said, the slice Wasserstein um, the implicit slice Fosher sign feature map because it's defined in terms of a kernel. Right. But, but abstractly also, just uh, the set of the, just if you consider the space of Perseus diagonals on endpoints, that will uh, coarsely embed in Hilbert space. Yeah. Right. Uh, that's right. Um, uh, all I was saying was that uh, there, we also have a very, we have an explicit um, feature that's map right. used yeah. in practice where we're in known this feature. But uh, as far as embeddable subspaces, I appreciate that question because there is one uh, point I wanted to make, which is that in the p equals infinity case, when you um, look at this, you're embedding these, um, these ZNMs uh, in such a way that they always go to finite diagrams. So in fact, uh, the proof here gives you that finite persistence diagrams with the bottleneck distance don't even coarsely embed. Um, so it's not just a pathology with, uh, in this case, infinite diagrams. It's also uh, the space of finite diagrams won't even uh, coarsely embed. Mm -hmm. Maybe we have time for one more question. Um, so hi, Henry, this is Guggen here. I had one question on notation. Uh, so when you write this subscript infinity, uh, uh, when you write this uh, infinity as a subscript for DGM, what do you mean by that infinity? I understand W infinity, but what does DGM infinity stand for? Thank you. Right, so it's the same way uh, when you write like LP, the sub P. So by diagram infinity, um, for diagram infinity, all you would mean is that um, you have uh, points which are finite distance from the diagonal. So you, they're not diverging off to infinity. Yeah. Um, for in general P, you would just want that if you uh, look at a persistence diagram, so a collection of points in the upper half plane, you compute all their distances to, the, to their projections on the diagonal. If you look at that sequence of numbers, you want that to have finite P norm. That's a, a persistence diagram, which is an element of the diagram sub P space. Thank you. All right, thanks again, Alex.